The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Hello, everyone. Welcome to this week's Best Practices webinar. As usual, we're going to give just a little bit of additional time for people that are just logging into the webinar to get connected. So we will be starting at about 102, maybe a few seconds, give or take, on that. So hold tight. We'll be starting in just a few moments. Hello, everyone. Welcome to today's Best Practices webinar put in uh, with partnership between TransFinder and NAPT. My name is Andrew Hamilton. I'm the Senior Application Specialist with TransFinder Corporation, and uh, I'm going to be in the background listening to today's webinar. I'm also going to be taking a look at the questions section of the GoToWebinar control panel. Now we want you to be able to take advantage of the fact that this is an interactive session to a degree. If you have questions or concerns that you'd like to share with our panelists as we go on, you can use the questions section of the GoToWebinar control panel to communicate with us. Now I'm very excited about today's presentation, uh, getting a seat at the table with decision makers. This is going to be uh, the first uh, part of a new panel discussion series that uh, we'll be doing on this particular topic. This topic has been a bit of a time uh, coming as several of our discussions about planning and decision making have involved getting the attention and buy-in from decision makers. So I'm very excited to be listening in on today's presentation topic. Now, uh, as much as I'd like to uh, continue to express my excitement for the day, I'm going to hand things over to Tony Civitella, the CEO of uh, TransFinder Corporation, for a few words. Tony, it's all yours. Thank you, Andy. Wow, your beard is getting longer, I could tell. So welcome to everybody. Uh, I just want to, it's our 11th best practice webinar today that we've conducted in partnership with NAPT. How exciting. Uh, like Andy said, today's a big one. It's getting a seat at the table with decision makers. Um, and we've been hearing this over and over again. It's critically important that transportation is part of this conversation. In order to restart schools, we got to get transportation involved in that. So we're going to talk about this. And of course, we have a new slate of panelists today who are going to be really tackling this issue and provide a model and how it should be done and how it is done. We got um, from Shenandoah's uh, Central School District, the Superintendent Dr. Oliver Robinson and uh, Transportation Supervisor Al Karam. They'll work to uh, they talk about how they work together and give us tips on how to improve the decision making process at your district. We also have Kurt Mackison from NSTA. He's also on the panel. And I can't wait to hear about uh, how everyone's going to talk about how to get the seat at the table. And I don't mean the small table. I remember during the holidays, you know, as little kids, we had the small table, the, the kids' table, right? The little kids' table. And then remember, as you grew up, you finally got to see, seat with the adults. And uh, you remember how he, all of a sudden, you know, you didn't just pop there, you eventually graduated closer and closer to grandpa or something like that. And all of a sudden, you know, when it was your turn, people started hearing you. And it was a little bit of pressure on us as we as we got older, but then people wanted to hear from us. You know, it's a new, new ideas. And that's that concept that you start from the little kids um, table. Now you're the big, the, the adults. And, and now the people want to hear from you. And of course, you have all these experience. You've heard all these things all these years. And now, like, when it's my turn, I'm going to have a good, I'm going to have a really good topic. So those are the type of things that I can't wait to hear about that. I'm sure we won't talk about meals because I'm actually hungry. But it's the concept that you get a seat at the table. And it's, it makes a lot of sense. Uh, a lot of people ask what happens. Uh, these webinars, listen, these are all recorded. They're anchored off our transfer.com. Uh, website. It's part of the best practices webpage. So 
again, record it. So any given time of transfunder.com, you will find these things. And uh, one last thing I want to make sure that we'll let you know that uh, our Stop Finder uh, communication app is being offered now for free to the rest of the school, uh, to the year really, end of um, December 31st. It's a, a we, can't, we always keep talking about, you can't over communicate with all this plan comes in. Again, we're offering this for free and it's not just for our clients, for anybody. It's Stop Finder app, it's the communication version. So you'll be able to have two-way communication with, with parents and, and even within the staff. Very important to, at this point, once our plans have you come up with a plan, then communicate that and make sure it gets executed properly by communicating. You need more information about how to get the Stop Finder app, send an email at free stop finder at transfinder.com and we'll get you started. But again, uh, we'll talk more about that. You'll hear a lot about that, uh, about communication. But I want to thank again uh, NAPT for the leadership that you provided uh, this, for this industry this, during this crisis. And I, I'm honored to be uh, really partnered with you on all these series. And it's a really important topic. So again, I can't wait. But now I'm going to turn it over to Rick Dorico, and uh, he's our moderator for today. So Rick. Thank you so much, Tony. Uh, I do remember being at the kids' table at Thanksgiving, by the way, for many, many, many years. So uh, that's actually a great analogy about being at the big table. Um, I want to introduce our panelists. You can come on as I call your name. Al Karam is the uh, Transportation Supervisor Director at Shenandoah Central Schools. Kurt Mackison is the Executive Director of the National School Transportation Association, as Tony just said. And Dr. Oliver Robinson is the Superintendent at Shenandoah Central Schools. And I want to thank all of you for joining us. I um, wanted to say up from the outset that I am monitoring also, as Andy mentioned, the questions that are coming in. And we will get to those as soon as we get it, as I start seeing good questions come in. So that's a uh, challenge to you. Give me some good questions and um, I will bring them to the panelists. Um, I just want to say that this panel has really been an outgrowth of several webinars that we've had where over and over again, that expression kept coming up about getting a seat at the table, about the importance of the, um, of the transportation uh, operation, having a seat at the table with the decision makers as they're deciding how they wanna reopen. Andy, you can move the next slide. And um, so I'm gonna just ask if we could just start off by going Al, Kurt, and then Dr. Robinson, I'm going alphabetical order here. If you could just talk a little bit about you know, your role and even just how um, you know, you're tackling your job amidst the, you know, the reason why we're doing these webinars is it's in the midst of this pandemic. So maybe a little bit about some changes that you've had to make as a result of this pandemic. So Al, take it away. Well, thank you very much, uh, Rick, and I appreciate the NAPT and TransFinder for uh, this opportunity uh, to be on this panel. Uh, and uh, I, I can tell you the past, uh, now we're going three months since the shutdown uh, started. Uh, we had to uh, grow very, very quickly and uh, do a lot of things that we simply were not doing before. Uh, and uh, we had to adapt uh, and at the same time continue uh, doing whatever uh, we could to position ourselves for, uh, uh, you know, whenever the schools uh, are going to open up to be ready for that as well. So uh, a lot of challenges, uh, but when you're working for, and I'm like, I'm, but I want to say it's not because Dr. Robinson is on this panel right now, because I'll tell him to his face. Uh, you, you know, when you have uh, a, a leader of your organization that allows you to do uh, your job and to uh, allow your verse to be heard, it makes the job that much more easier. Excellent. Thank you so much. Kurt. Yeah, thanks, Rick. And uh, thank you to Transfinder and NAPT. Um, you know, for hosting this panel, I think it's uh, always uh, important that uh, we share information, especially during the uh, pandemic. I mean, from my standpoint, we've taken a system, um, student transportation, that was largely a pretty stable system um, and executed, well-executed system, and we turned it upside down with the pandemic uh, in that it's very, even even now, it's very difficult to plan for the future. And a lot of the concern that's going around, um, you know, in my organization, which is represents the private school bus contractors, you know, has kind of morphed from, you know, contracts and dealing with a lot of the um, 
existing contracts to what are the new provisions that are going to um, hopefully address the COVID situation moving forward. And then if you overlay that against, um, you know, all states are probably going to be in a funding crisis as we move forward. So what, you know, what does that look like? And I, I think one thing that happened in the last week that really speaks to why having a panel like this and why having a strategy is important is, was the decision from the uh, Center for uh, Disease Control and Prevention that came out on school bus. And it was almost like the stock market uh, with an unemployment report coming out. And this report comes out and then transportation hears that on a 72 passenger school bus, we could only have eight passengers. And how are we gonna deal with that? And, and with all due respect to the CDC, they're just looking at it from a health situation. They're not looking at it holistically. And that's really where the voice of student transportation comes in because you all are the experts in this and we've got to have a seat at the table to let parents know one, it's safe your child back on that school bus, but two, this is our plan and this is how we plan on executing that. So uh, you know, I thank you for the opportunity to come on and look forward to the discussion today. Super, thanks so much, Kurt. Dr. Robinson. Uh, thank you very much, Rick. It's certainly um, great to be here and to those listening, recognizing that, you know, schools are, are, are interesting organizations. I say that in the sense that oftentimes people try to paint it with a single bus, a brush that schools is about kids. Well, when you think about it, um, at Shen, we have a, a 200 plus bus operation, one of the largest ones in the region, if not the state. We have a, a significant food service operation, significant grounds operation. So you, you just name it. And, and so, so when we find ourselves in the midst of situations such as this COVID-19 pandemic, um, it brings all that to a head in terms of, of the quality leadership that you have on your team and, and the structures that you have in place um, to, to be able to continue to, to function in a, in a seamless way. And so I think in a call today, we'll, we'll talk about those things because I think that, you know, while places might be even struggling right now, um, it's never too late to, to right size and fine tune processes moving forward because schools are going to open and schools are going to stay in business. The question is, are we going to open and stay in a business at a high level or are we going to open and stay in business at a struggling level? And I think that's the questions that most leaders have to wrestle with and come up with plans and so hopefully today we'll be able to, to contribute something to that um, as people go through those um, that sequence of deliberations. That's great, and I, I think that's a great take -away. starting off point is just to say it's never too late. So some people, I wanna make it very clear to some folks, Shenandoah is in the, really the backyard of TransFinder and we know um, just how, I, I really believe that you guys are role models. Uh, a lot of pressure on you now, um, but I think those who log on, can we'll be able to glean some true um, you know, tips from you because I do feel like you're doing it right. And I think there's a lot of lessons that we can be that can be learned. But it's nice to hear that it's never too late um, to get started. Um, and I want to make it clear to anybody listening that this is a conversation. And so, you know, every, everybody had I, I want you guys to feel free to be very comfortable to piggyback on each other's comments and and expand in any way you see uh, necessary. L, we talked a little bit earlier about the, uh, when you came on about, you said six years ago, was it? Yes. Um, that you knew right off the bat, Dr. Robinson saw a value in in having um, communication with all departments. Can you just give us a little sense of how it's evolved um, since you've been there? Well, I can tell you that uh, since I started uh, within my first year, uh, Dr. Robinson uh, opened up uh, his district level uh, super supervisory team uh, to uh, not only transportation, but food service, uh, grounds, uh, uh, operations, uh, so that we do have a seat at the table, so we are part of the conversation. Uh, for me, it, it was very important that that happened. Uh, I may not have a lot to offer at each and every meeting, but if I listen to everybody around the table to their uh, challenges uh, within the different departments, uh, be it uh, uh, grounds or be it at uh, the educational level, uh, then I could come back here and get with my team and formulate, uh, you know, how we can best help and support uh, these different entities. And as Dr. Robinson uh, 
uh, reminds us often that we are a system. We're all together. We're all interdependent on each other. And, but uh, you also mentioned that there's like a dash that goes directly to the superintendent. That you can get directly in front of the superintendent to, to bring things before him. Yeah, so uh, Dr. Robinson, again, uh, towards the end of my first year here, uh, he uh, wanted all his uh, supervisors to take a look at the uh, organizational structure. And typically, the organizational structure has solid lines, you know, from the uh, bottom on uh, up as to who uh, you communicate with. And uh, he simply uh, took that uh, and, and added a dash line. So uh, I don't need, if I need to get to him quickly, I don't need to follow the solid line. Uh, I go directly to him through that dash line, if you will. Uh, made it uh, uh, much easier. I can email him, I can text him, I can call him uh, a lot of times without the traditional model of having to go through. Uh, because Chen is so big, I, I actually have uh, two bosses that I uh, have to go through, one on the HR side, assistant superintendent, and the other one on the finance side and operations, uh, the assistant superintendent for that. So may makes life a whole of a lot easier, just that one concept of a dash line, if you will. Dr. Robertson, can you give me a sense of where that, even that philosophy or that approach came about? You were at a smaller district before you came over to Shen. Did you, how did you um, like develop this, this practice? Uh, you said, I think it was originally you used to meet, was it daily? And then you moved it down to um, three days a week. But give me a sense of how that, how that has evolved um, over time. So I, I think, Rick, this, this comes from, a, for me, so for way of background briefly here, my background is economics. Um, so, so I share that with you because a lot of my foundational um, knowledge comes from the field of economics. And, and so, so when I think about the organization, I think about the organization from a production function model. What I mean by that, you have input, you have processes, you have outputs. And so consequently, if our output, our outcome is the quality of education or experience for our students, I didn't have to think about what are all the processes that makes that happen. And consequently, all the processes are transportation and everything else that makes that happen. And, and so, so when we start thinking about um, whatever um, outcome we want, we can't guess what our outcomes are. We have to be able to be able to predict our outcome by the processes we have in place by the input that we put into our system. And, and so, so that then requires um, a, a reliance on the expertise of everyone within the system to bring their best knowledge to the table. Consequently, we have to put the structures in place that allows for that to happen or, or the converse, as I said, to, to eliminate um, ignorance being an excuse. So we can't ever have someone say, well, I, I couldn't do it because I didn't know or I didn't know I had authority to do it because at the end of the day, it's all about productivity. And so, so we come to the table with that mindset that it's about productivity and subsequently then we build the structures to lend to that productivity. Ironically, the structures that we've built into the past made it very easy or a lot easier for us to pivot in this current COVID situation because people were already programmed to be in that systems model, already programmed to, to to, to know that they have uh, a responsibility for their domain, but their domain is a, is a part of a larger network. Um, and so, so the conversations became very easy to have when we brought everyone together as a collective and even when we separated people to go in their, on their own accord and come back together again. So it's kind of like, you know, it's, it's, a, it's, um, it's, a, it's a very, it's a, it's a very bright, vibrant system where we kind of constantly go from micro, from micro to macro, from macro to micro, large to small, and each time we're growing. And, and so you kind of think about it and almost kind of think of like, almost like an amoeba, so to speak. Now each time we add a layer, add a layer, and we keep growing in effectiveness as a system. And so, so that's how the model comes from. And, and I think people on board now understand the system concepts and they understand the role that they play into the larger whole. And I want to get into some specifics in a second about what that looks like, but I want to go to Kurt for a second. Um, all these questions now are going through my mind. Kurt, um, is this what you're seeing at other school districts? Is this like a typical model or is this something that, um, you know, is, is not happening enough uh, to have transportation at the table with all these other department heads and be part of that uh, discussion? 
Yeah, I mean, the one thing you, you, you find in a pandemic, if you didn't know it already, is that the, the uh, education system is a patchwork um, across federal, state, local. And to Dr. Robinson's point, it's like, how do we weave all these uh, interested parties together and come up with a cohesive um, solution? So the, the answer to your short answer to your question is some are, Rick, some aren't. Um, uh, to Dr. Robinson's other point about having the structure in place certainly helps you, uh, you know, jump in uh, quickly and, uh, you know, get to solutions faster. But, you know, if you don't have that structure in place, you know, it is a wake up call to, to put that structure kind of structure in place. I don't want to hit upon one subject um, that Dr. Robinson talked about as well. And that was his economics background and the talk, the discussion of process to outcome. And I think that's the biggest challenge I see in, in this whole pandemic is that people, um, just the way society is today, want to skip the process and get right to the output and the outcome. And th that's why we see this myriad of solutions that haven't been well thought out. Um, you know, come to the forefront. So I applaud them for, you know, having a process, sticking to that process, and, and really encourage everyone to be disciplined to go through that process. And I realize, I know what I do with it myself, that the external forces are kind of, um, you know, chopping at the bit to get to the, you know, the output, but you can't skip it or else we're going to miss vital, you know, pieces in constructing that solution. Go ahead, Al. Yeah, so so the other day we had a, a meeting with uh, uh, all the leadership, uh, not just uh, the uh, district level, but school principals and all, right? And um, uh, I forget, I, I don't recall the exact comment I made, but a uh, principal uh, came back and, and picked up on my comment and, and said, you know, what Al just talked about transportation, we really didn't think about in terms of what we're doing in our plan to reopen schools. And uh, so, and, and that's a point that I've been, you know, I've been pushing at the table is that, um, and, and actually the athletic director uh, came up with it the other day. He said, everything starts with and everything ends with transportation. So you can have all the plans, but if we're not at the table, uh, we're not gonna be able to tell you if your plans are gonna be feasible and executable, just not gonna happen. And so uh, I'm, I'm lucky enough to be in a district where we do have a voice and, and we're talking across the spectrum of what makes up school district uh, as we uh, work on all these plans uh, to, uh, to affect uh, the school uh, reopening. Well, it seems like it kind of averts the, uh, those silos and even that um, he said, she said, and so it kind of creates a uh, cohesive team. You almost feel like you're all really are in this thing together. I mean, I know when I hear school districts that started delivering food, um, they had to work very closely with food service, and I think they gave them a new appreciation for each other and the role they each played. Dr. Robertson, I'm wondering if you could just kind of, and Al, both of you, um, could maybe just walk us through, I think some people just maybe would want to see what does a meeting look like? I mean, actually, like, how does it, is it the same days of the week, every week? Is it in the calendar? I mean, literally, like, be as specific as you can about, do you go around the table and have everybody um say something about their department or is it a standing meeting al that's a military thing right standing meetings so they don't stay too long um but any either one of you or both of you jump in and kind of give us a picture of what this really does look like to be at the table so so rick let me again i think context is important right and and as a district we've always had the and i'm going to use the word requirement um, to, to put it in a very formal way, that people have some type of planning mechanism, some way that you're planning your work, some way that you're documenting your work. And, and so, so it's not a prescription to say you have to do it this way or that way, but you need to have some way to document what we do. Because for one, we know that so much of our work is cyclical. And so we, if, we, if we know what a cycle is, we can predict what's coming, right? And we can fine tune those cycles and be better each time um, the proverbial wheel goes around. And, and so because we were already in that from a, a, a practice mode, as well as a psychological mode, when we shift to virtual space and start having virtual meetings, we 
created, we have a whole um, comprehensive remote planning Google folder. And within that folder, we have folders for every department, every school level. And, and, and within that, people are documenting their plans because we're doing a couple of things. One, we're, we're making sure that, that we're, missing, we're not missing any beat from the things that we're supposed to have been doing, um, which is huge. And Al could talk about some of those kind of things. So, so we can't lose sight of the fact that certain things must happen regardless of whatever condition that we're in. And two, as we um, go through these unprecedented times, we're also documenting and compares, comparing to those cycles. So it's almost like a parallel universe all the time to say we would have done this, but the circumstances not call for this. And how can we then look at both things and make the best decision based upon those factors? And almost back to something that Kurt said before, that the decisions aren't, aren't knee jerk. The decisions aren't about how. The decision always focus on what do we want to achieve. And after we have, and so our meetings are often time about, about what are the things that we want to achieve. And then we talk about how do we best do those things and who else does it impact. And so, so when we have our, our be it Monday, Friday, Monday, Wednesday, Friday meetings, we go through each person and, and they talk about what are the big rocks. We use that term big rocks all the time. What are the big rocks things that you're focused on? I, I don't need to know how many emails you read, but if you read an email that has a significant impact on something that we're doing on a system, then we need to have that conversation because it's important then that, that people hear what transportation is doing because it would trigger, wow, if trans is doing that or not doing that, here's the implication for me. And so, so it's, it's a part of, 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 of the dialogue that we have created to ensure that, that people on board, and Al alluded to the dots on our organizational chart. That dot implies that everyone should be talking to everyone all the time. And, and so, so, so there's no reason why, you know, someone can't say, well, I, I didn't know Al was doing it. Well, if you thought this could have impacted Al, you should have been in communication with Al. Or if you thought this could have been a benefit to Al, you should have been in communication with Al, vice versa. So, so our meetings are a lot of that. And, and so it, we start with things people are doing, and then my role as superintendent is to always try to put into the larger context of how does this play out in our system? Because it's always important for people to realize that every person has an impact and add value to the system that, that we're dealing with. And just to take this step one step further is we know that right now um, there's so many uncertainties that we're dealing with. And, and we also know that effective, that leadership is about effectively managing ambiguity. And the only way we can manage ambiguity is to bring the expertise to the table. Um, I can make assumptions about transportation. I know a lot about transportation, but I don't live the nuances of transportation every day. So subsequently having the experts at the table then gives us a better picture. And sometimes even if the answer is we can't do this, I always say at least now we know what we can't do or better yet, we know what we need to do to make it happen if it's in fact something that we need to get done. And so, so it opens up all those possibilities in our conversations and subsequently in our actions. Yeah, you made me think of something. Uh, so I used to be a reporter at a business paper and sometimes we would um, just have brainstorming sessions among ourselves as reporters and editors about a special feature on let's say healthcare. And we're brainstorming. And then finally at some point somebody said, how about if we brought in a couple of CEOs from hospitals and they can give us some guidance and what we should be writing about because they're in the woods. I mean, they're in the thick of things. They can tell us. And then all of a sudden that, out of that came these events that came out every month on those specific topic areas. When you talked about bringing experts at the table, it just made me think of that, that you can brainstorm or make assumptions, I think is the word expression you use. And why make an assumption when I can go right over here to Al or to this person in this other department and say, I can, um, you know, go right to the source. Um, Al, anything, I want to jump in. I have one other quick question, to Al, Dr. Robinson, before I go to Al about the meetings. And that is, these are also, it sounds like they have a little bit of a component of brainstorming. So you actually could have somebody who's not even in your specialty area, your expert area, who may be able to still have, because they don't have maybe um, encumbered by the past, they can kind of give up a, an idea that, oh, we never thought of it that way. It's a fresh set of eyes. Is that correct? Does that happen? Yeah, you know, so so I, I think a mistake that sometimes organization make is that they they pigeonhole people to positional titles. Al is a leader, happened to be a leader in transportation, but 
his first role is to be a leader. And so the expectation then is that as a leader, he's listening with that, that ear, he's looking at things from that objective, and then he's saying, how does the specific area that he oversees impact that piece of it? So, 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 so the expectation is that, that we want people to be thought provoking. You know, here at Shen, I, I call it poking holes. We poke holes in things all the time, poke holes in ideas, poke holes in thoughts, ask the question, interrogate people's thinking so that we know that when we're done with all that and we make a decision, we know that we have thought about all the things because it's such a complex mesh that impacts it, especially now we're thinking about school opening. You know, if I, if I spend all my time focused on instruction and not thinking about operations, I'm completely missing the mark. Vice versa, if I spend all my time thinking about operations and I think about instruction, same thing. And so, so we know that that it's it's all the parts and the sum of the parts is the side cliche is greater than any individual. The sum is greater than any individual part. And so, so we take that perspective, and there is an expectation that that people poke holes in people's ideas or ask questions about people's ideas. And you know what? And that's a different type of environment because there's some people who. Who, who, you know, don't want someone to say, Al, tell me, why, why do you think that's a good idea? Because I really want to know why you think that's a good idea. Right. Um, right. And because okay. I probably never even thought about that idea before. And that idea, I often say to folks, not every good idea needs to be implemented, but every idea will influence the next one. And and, and that's our job is to to constantly go through this um, this, this, this iterative, iterative process so that we're making the best decision. And that's why you say what the meetings look like, the meetings look like people have the opportunity to influence where we're going as a system. And, and some people are, are more um, um, prepared, more versed for it. And, and I also know that people enter the conversations at different points, um, different levels at different points. And some points, some people sit quietly because maybe not the time. Because I tell people, just don't say something just to say something. Say something because you're going to add value to the, to, the, to the conversation as we move forward. And that works for us as a system. That's our organizational culture. That's our culture as a system. It was our culture before. And I think that culture has even enhanced and gotten tighter now. The degree of comfort that people have with each other right now is greater than any other time in our organization. And a lot of it is because we all realize that we're in uncharted waters. And we all realize that, you know, we're on a proverbial boat. And we all, everyone need the next person to get to the other side. And, and, and so there's no I or me, it's about us. How can we effectively do it? And that has fundamentally, and will continue to fundamentally change how we lead the organization moving forward. That's awesome. Al, thank you so much, Dr. Robinson. Al, um, you wanna piggyback on that a little bit? Yeah, sure. So uh, one of, in your original question, you said, well, how did uh, you know your meetings kind of uh, uh, change, right? So yeah. ju just to set it before the shutdown, uh, our DLSD team would meet uh, once per month, uh, and uh, I don't know, maybe a year or so ago, Dr. Yeah. Robinson, you came up with the uh, quarterly uh, 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 meetings with each department head, right? Uh, come down to our workspace and, and meet with us one-on-one, -on -one, uh, so we can have again that kind of communication. But anyway, we went from that monthly meeting, we shut down to five a day, uh, five days, Monday through Friday, virtual meetings because we had to do that quick pivot to everything virtual, send everybody home, work from home, uh, with the exception of uh, a small crew. Uh, and once we got everybody, uh, you know, working from home, uh, we got all those plans uh, in place, uh, then uh, we ratcheted that back down to uh, three meetings, or Dr. Robinson did three meetings per, per week. So that's how we went from one to five to three. That's what's working for us now. How long are they usually? Uh, an hour. Sometimes it could be longer. Uh, and uh, honestly, I also uh, use the same model. I meet Monday through Friday most weeks with my uh, office staff, who predominantly is working uh, from home. Uh, to give them whatever support they, they need, you know, find out what kind of help they're looking for or issues they may be uh, running against. So same kind of model on our level, um, and, and it's working out uh, uh, great for us. Great. Kirk, Rick, I want to ask you a question, and I do have a question from the uh, attendees. Um, yeah, Rick, I, I one thing to add to that before we, we got to that, and that we started this conversation by saying, you know, some of us are going to have to transition from the kids' table to the to the big table. And and that and that it, it's so true. And to Dr. Robinson's point, 
um, all the input is welcome, but it's not a case of immediate gratification that all your ideas or concepts are going to be embraced at one time. And so you kind of have to get to the table and understand that that uh, every different organization I'm involved with has a different way that they process information and a different way of um, getting to that uh, approval process. So don't be discouraged if people are not uh, embracing your ideas right off the bat. It's just kind of the, the nature of the beast in decision making that, that you bring all these different personalities together with the hope that you'll get to a common ground solution at the end of the day. That's great. That's a good point. Um, and this is for both you, Kurt, and Dr. Robinson. I mean, Al, for sure, you know, jump in as well. Um, what happens if you have a superintendent? I think that Dr. Robinson, you know, there's a humility there to want more people at the table and to realize I'm not an expert in everything. What happens if any guidance? I'm just thinking of some attendees that may be saying, this is all well and good, but I don't even know how I would even begin to approach my superintendent or do I go to the school board or do what? What is the, if you say you have a superintendent that maybe um, is resistant to this idea, um, and that doesn't, that sounds maybe negative, but just, you know, hasn't expressed an, an openness to this idea. How do you start? Any ideas that you would recommend to a transportation supervisor like Al to say, I want to have a seat do, not in a, you know, kind of like pounding my chest kind of way, but saying, I really believe our district will be better off if, all these departments, like Shen has um, people at the table. Kurt, for starters, and then Dr. Robinson, how would you, and then Al, of course, how would you start? I'm always a big believer in the chain of command and, and never go, uh, you know, around the, the chain of command. So whatever that is, you know, follow it. But I also think uh, from the standpoint of dealing with people, um, you know, in, in the chain of command, um, if you're a leader, you can identify the problem, but you also come up with a solution. And so I think it's incumbent that, you know, in any situation, if you're identifying a problem, if you're seeing a breach in communication, that you also come on with this solution to that to that problem. And maybe that's as easy as, hey, listen, I'd like to be part of your Wednesday meetings uh, and, and broach that subject, uh, you know, that way. I love that idea of you don't want to be that guy it's like, oh, here comes Rick again, bring another. So bring a solution with you when you're going to approach the superintendent, whatever that chain of command is. Act, that's a great takeaway. Dr. Robinson? Um, sure. Thanks, Rick. So, so you know, the scenario that you just described is, is, is as much a mindset problem as, problem as it is a practice problem. Um, and I think the mindset drives the practice, right? And so the so reason why I say that is, um, uh, something that again, Al certainly could um, can um, I confer with is that I often say it's not what we get, it's not who gets credit, but what we get credit for. And and so if I'm the transportation person, and if my goal is I want to get credit for it as a transportation person, you're probably going to approach it wrong. You're probably going to approach it and rub somebody the wrong way, and you're probably going to be too wedded to your idea. Um, to the point when your idea is not um, embraced fully, it becomes your frustration and then, you know, and everything's fall apart. So, 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 so building the culture of an organization isn't the responsibility of the quote unquote leader of the organization, it's everybody's responsibility. And so back to Kurt's point of it, you know, as a transportation person, you have a peculiar, particular lens in terms of how you look at the transportation, how you look at the community, how you understand the needs of, uh, of, of the students. And so that's something that, that the person may not even realize that you have that, that vantage point, that appreciation. And so if your goal is to help the organization, the school district as a whole be better, if you take the tack that it's not if I get credit for it, it's that we just wanna make sure we're doing the right thing. I guarantee you will influence the culture in a positive way, even for if you have a superintendent who thinks that he or she should be taking all the credit for everything. And so subsequent, because that person, if that's the arrogance that person has, trust me, they're going to want to have good ideas so to make sure that, that things work out as well. So so, so that's why I say it's, it's, it's as much psychological as it is practice. And I think sometimes, you know, people get bent out of shape that, you know, you didn't ask me. 
Well, okay, if just because I didn't ask you doesn't mean you couldn't tell. Um, if you have something that's worthwhile to, to add to the equation, bring it to the equation. And you know, because you're not bringing it because you want to get credit, you bring it because it's the right thing to do. And right. so the, I would encourage folks to say, you know what, Throw, send the idea, send the information. You never know when that information is going to, to, to fall in that fertile soil and, and, and blossom to be that, 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 that tree that we want, so to speak. And so, so I think that's the mindset that sometimes people want to say, I'm going to wait to they ask me. Because Al knows that, guess what? We, we have so many moving parts and so many things. I tell people, guess what? Pride and ego has no place. And, and just because I didn't ask your help, it's because probably I didn't even realize that, that you were there to be asked for. And if you have something to contribute, shame on you that you didn't contribute the, to, the, to the equation because we want the best thinking. You know, so, so I think, again, people need to know that title aside, they have a leadership responsibility to help mold the culture of the organization. And it starts with your department. I mean, again, kudos to Al. Al has molded a culture in his department where, where people are taking leadership responsibilities all over the place. And, and, and so all of a sudden you have more people want to take on leadership responsibilities. That's a thriving department. And so now he's the model and he knows that three summers ago, we had a, a, our, all our administrative supervisors and the model we use for buildings to do transition planning came from transportation because when Al came on board, he wanted to make sure that people were cross-trained, there was transition plans in place, all those things, because he realized that he couldn't afford to call me up and say, hey, by the way, we can't get buses out on time because the one dispatcher we have is out sick. Uh, well, that's not acceptable. We need to have other people to be able to step into the, into the game and make sure that the system continues. And so, so that's why I said part of it is much mindset as it is practice. Very good. Al, you were shaking your head. Do you have something you want to add? Yeah, so from, from my perspective, right, transportation directors are both managers and leaders. Those are two distinct, uh, uh, takes two distinct uh, skill sets to do that, right? So in this environment, and, and really takes us back to why we're here today, right? How do we get a, a, a seat at the table? As a leader, you got to think as a leader, you uh, as a transportation director, you're overseeing anywhere between five to 10% of the district budget. That's a big chunk of change. And you have to be, uh, you cannot personalize your approach. It has to be professional approach. And you have to approach the decision makers in your district and not demand, but paint them a picture why it's important for you to be at that table. Uh, I've worked for four superintendents and three of the four were outstanding. Uh, one was not. Uh, and he's, you know, one who had a big uh, uh, kind of a, a, a attitude, whatever. Uh, so uh, ego and what have you. So, uh, but I can tell you, my my first superintendent, the, the same thing. I approached him. Uh, transportation was not part of the uh, uh, bigger district uh, a group, if you will, the decision makers. And and uh, I explained to him why it's important. Uh, and uh, he bought into it got to see it on that table and and uh you know now it's all history so as leaders we have to be bold enough professional enough uh have the data to back us up and put that on the table for uh the superintendent or the assistant superintendent you know i hear so often from my colleagues that well uh they, they won't listen to me why why aren't they listening to you it comes down to you as the leader and and just because somebody fluffed you off once doesn't mean you run back to your office, slide the door, throw your hands up in the air and say, I give up. And, and I've seen yeah. folks like that sit in, our, in, in my seat, not necessarily here, but you know, uh, uh, genetically speaking. So my, my advice is get up and be the leader that you were hired to be. I know this may sound a little corny, people talk about, but I, I think it's still true to be the change you wanna see. And to use my mom as an example, she worked in this one, um, uh, office and never the twain so many people just didn't really mingle at all and so she started to um, celebrate everybody's birthday now she had no leadership role per se she didn't have a title or anything but so she would find out whose birthday it was and make a cake and then little by little she kind of said now you get to make the cake for the next birthday because she didn't want to be making all the cakes you know at the end of the day they all became really good friends they started getting together once a week or every couple of weeks and she became that change was little so my as you were talking dr robinson i was thinking 
could if I was Al, could I invite? Maybe i have not been invited yet to have a seat at the table with the at the district leadership level. How about if I ask the superintendent to come to transportation? I make him or her a rock star and say, "Hey, look who we have visiting," and 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 try to bridge that. Start that. Is that a crazy idea, or do you think that would be? Would that be received well? Anybody can jump in on that answer. Uh, no, I mean that that that's so that's quite frank. I'm laughing because we just did what Al two weeks ago or something, um, and and that happens all the time because one of the things that you know it, it's I, I tell people all the time use me to help whatever you need. So if 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 my presence help empower your people, use me. Have me come. And so we we were talking about that a couple of weeks ago. We had uh, our mechanics. These guys have been busting their humps, making sure that, and and because of that, our passing rate is like 99.9%, some ridiculous wow. um, um, inspection passing rate. And they were they were doing all this at the same time that the the garage bays, the the jacks were being repaired. And so so yeah, so you have guys who just just working hard. And Al say, stop by one morning, and I did, and he called all the mechanics in, and and you know what? It was great for me for one for me to see and appreciate what they're doing. And it was great for them to know that they're valued because here's you have a group of folks that are working hard well, when they know that there's some people who are not working hard because their jobs doesn't allow for them to do certain things. And so so that's where the leadership piece come in at. So so it's 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 how do we use the, the influence of, of each other to, to help influence those that we know we need to keep motivated all the time. And so so absolutely. And, and so it was a twofold. I'm doing Al a favor, so to speak, if you want to call it that. And 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 the, the the all those mechanics walked away feeling valued and empowered. And I walked away significantly more knowledgeable because we passed the 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 the, the resolution to repair the the jacks in the in the bus garage. But to be quite frank with you, I, I probably would have never see have seen them under construction ever until that opportunity came and so so for me it became like wow this is pretty cool so now we see where we're spending all the money so to speak on these kind of things and having conversations and hear how this is going to enhance efficiencies all of a sudden my appreciation for transportation you know went up a whole different notch an additional notch because i know what when we say you know our buses are safe i know what our buses are safe mean and and so so you're right so we have to invite people into our houses so they can have an appreciation how we live, and so they could understand that we're also part of the neighborhood, and we're all one neighborhood, one one ecosystem, you know. And and that's, that's the big piece they want to make sure that people know it's an ecosystem. Very good. I saw some nodding heads here, both Kurt and Al. Anything you guys want to add? Yeah, Rick. The one thing I would say is that um, also somebody in Al's position is representative of his department. I'm sure he has department meetings. And we'll go to the to larger senior staff meeting and say, hey, a couple of my folks giving credit uh, had this idea about a certain issue um, and to give it credibility. And from uh, Dr. Robinson's standpoint, um, I still even go back, and, and this is so so different nowadays, but it was that philosophy of management by walking around. And it was the idea of once in a while, it's good to see Dr. Robinson at the depot, you know, uh, you know, engaging with um, you know the employees there right. so uh, you, you know I, I think that's a challenge moving forward with this pandemic that i hope we don't get away from is that that uh, uh regular contact with individuals even if it's not in a quote-unquote meeting setting as well just to go over take the temperature and you'll find out um a whole lot when you're talking with people even if it's not in a meeting setting sometimes you find out more that's well i was wondering if well Al, i don't want to cut you off was there something you were gonna you were gonna add no, go ahead. Okay. I'm just agreeing well, with the comments. I was just wondering if um, if there might be sometimes when a superintendent may not feel like that's their, you know, maybe they don't feel welcome. So, you know, like, you know, I think you do feel welcome there, Dr. Robertson. And you can say as superintendent, you can go anywhere you want to in the district. You're the head of the district. But there may be some that feel like that's not my purview. So by having the super, by having the transportation supervisor Warn, bring them in. You are not. You may be knocking down some barriers that, whether they were ever there or not, intentionally may exist. Is that possible, Al? 
so have you ever experienced that in any of the other districts you worked at where I, there was I, a hard line between again with one superintendent there was not that good of a relationship but you know uh, sometimes i could be uh, like a bull in a china shop and i kept <laughs> my foot forward on the gas anyway uh, but yeah look I'll share again my experiences here at Shen, right? One of the things that Dr. Ross talked about, you know, culture, right, and transportation. One of the things that, uh, the, or the challenges that I had here was that it was that uh, animosity between transportation and uh, the schoolhouses, uh, and typically they, they targeted uh, the, the principals. So I had to change that. Uh, that that's that's a corrosive type environment. I had to change it, and I couldn't do it by myself. This was a team effort, both uh, you know with, with uh, the staff here, uh, again working closely with uh, school administration, and working closely with with the uh, school principals. We have turned the corner on that. It took us up two three years, but we turned the corner on that. So uh, again, you know. As a supervisor, you cannot just sit back and, and say, "Well, they, you know, they don't like me, or my employees don't want this superintendent here." That, that's BS. Uh, you, you just got to you got to change it. That's a culture issue, and you have to change that. That's why we're in these positions. So here's one of the things I wanted to throw out. So you know, as um, as schools are starting to discuss reopening, um, you're hearing a lot of different um, concepts out there, like you know, multi-tiered system or alternating days of the week and that kind of stuff. And, and with transportation not at the table, sometimes the ramifications of those decisions are not as clearly understood, to be put it nicely. Um, so I guess I want to get your thoughts because we want to, there's a practical reason why it's um, important to have transportation at the table is that you will avert potential problems. I think that that's come clear. Can you give a sense, any of you can jump in on this, what kinds of things are we talking about that could become pitfalls if you don't have transportation at the table? Well, let, let me let me uh, address that first, please. So uh, we don't have solid plans yet as to how September is going to look. We know it's going to look hybrid, whatever that hybrid is. But within that hybrid uh, topic, we've heard bits and pieces, and, and I've shared data with Dr. Robinson where we took some of those bits and pieces and actually put that on paper by numbers. This is what, for example, you know, going back to the CDC, what the CDC is recommending, right? Uh, and honestly, that for me, that didn't just come from CDC, that came from discussions that were happening online in, in these types of forums, whatever, where people said, you know, we have to social distance on the bus. And that went to, you know, 11, 12 kids per bus. Well, okay, let's put that on paper so I can show the decision makers what the, what that means. And right out of the, the gate, before we even turn the lights on, in this operation, we're 32 buses short, let alone having the drivers, right? Uh, and even these ideas of, well, if you bring kids, you know, uh, half in one day, whatever, you're gonna have excess drivers. Nothing could be further from the truth. So we're taking these bits and pieces, right? Not necessarily coming up with solid plans, but putting these schemes together uh, to show that you know it sounds great and people really mean well when they when they present it to you. But Dr. Robinson, here's what it looks like in numbers, and here's what reality will dictate. And and to his credit, because we're having these kinds of discussions, and uh, I'm not waiting on somebody to hand me a plan and run with it, right? Uh, he's made you know comments that we're going to do what is feasible. We, so whatever that looks like, you know, if it doesn't look uh, like 11 kids per bus, it's not going to look like 11 kids per bus. Right. Anybody else want to jump in on that? I, I just think when you go through that process, I guess to Al's point is that you, the output is something when you go through the process is defensible. So if then when questioned on it, you can explain it fully on how you arrived at the, that decision, which I think in this particular case, when we're talking about responses to the pandemic is critical um, because we have to give confidence to all those stakeholders that it's safe to put their child on a school bus. You know, And that's why I think 
you know, so that's why I think it's dangerous if we bypass the process just to get to the outcome. And but that is society today. We want to bypass, you know, that process and get to the outcome. But that's why I emphasize we have to be, you know, very diligent and disciplined. Um, no shortcuts. No shortcuts. Yep. Dr. So, Robert, um, are you going to add something? Just, sure. Um, just want to add to use. I'm going to start with two words that that we use here quite a bit. And Al, being a military guy, appreciates it. Um, um, being tactical and being strategic, and 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 that forces us to yeah. So we we know what the current damage is, the current conditions are. Okay, so we know that, but we're not going to perseverate on that. We're then trying to figure out, okay, based on these conditions, what are the best options, the best move to position ourselves for the next situation out? And so, so that's why we do a lot of scenario analysis and, 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 and try to, to identify what's feasible, um, what, what, what may cost us more, cost us less, all those things so that once we get the guardrails from the state or whomever going to come out with a final set of guidelines, um, we we'll know we we'll, at that point we we'll know what we can effectively do, and so 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 we're not reacting. We've already gone through this extensive analysis as a part of that. The tactical part is showing up on the scene, right, and seeing what happened, what happened, how it happened, how it is, and now the strategic part is how do we want avoid this again? Two, how do we learn from this? Three, how do we position ourselves to take advantage of the situation? And part of that is not necessarily even about the numbers, about the number of kids. I think Kurt hit a great point. It's about the psychological piece. It's about how do we psychologically get drivers in a psychological state that they want to be back driving a bus? How do we get parents in a state that, that, that we're doing all the things to disinfect buses so they know when their child is on the bus, the bus is, is disinfected? And so those aren't the how things. Those are still the what things. What do we need to do? And then we get caught. Then we finally say, okay, now we know this. Now the strategic part is how do we best do it to again keep positioning ourselves for continued prosperity, and I think that that type of approach to things engenders and supports people coming to the table with different ideas, and knowing that people, you know, we can be we're all passionate about the ideas we bring to the table. We all want the ideal, and 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 so we want people to bring the passionate ideal, and we also let people know that it fits into a larger whole because you know I have instruction to folks say we want it this way. That's great. That's wonderful. And that can happen if this could happen, but barring this, that can't happen. And so we're going to have something that's going to be a hybrid of those things in order for us to take advantage of the resources that we have. And, and so so big part of the leadership piece is also getting people into that mindset of bringing best ideas and all the best ideas morphed into a better idea and a better idea is morphed into something that we can effectively implement. Ideas are wonderful. But if it can be implemented, it was just a great conversation to have. <laughs> that's a good, that's a great point. I love that. Um, I'm going to ask you guys. We're getting kind of close to wrapping up here, and I'm going to ask you. And Antonio would like to say say uh, just a, a thank you at the end. But I wanted to just see if you. I'm a big believer in this idea of having one at least one takeaway. There's a lot of takeaways, by the way. You've given a. I, by the way, I should give you that some of the feedback. I've seen in some of the, not a lot of questions, I think people are just absorbing all that you're sharing, but just talking about what a level of respect between the departments, it's very um, encouraging. And people, kudos to you, Dr. Robinson, for being so open and willing to look and work outside the box, I love it. Um, so just some really nice comments, and I think that's why we knew you guys were a great role model for this kind of um, topic. Um, it's always helpful to have one takeaway. I'm hoping that people will have five takeaways or more. There's a lot that I took away. But can I just start, we'll go with Al, Kurt, and Dr. Robinson again. One thing that you you want people to make sure they take, take back to their office with them. Be the leader that you are hired to be. I cannot overemphasize that. That's why you're in that position. Don't wait on others to lead you, right? So. And as a leader, you need to be forward thinking. And, and I'll give you this quick analogy, right? When things shut down, literally operations, school districts in total shut down and people went home. We didn't do that here. If we had done that, if Dr. Robinson, for example, said, no, 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 I'm not going to listen to you. This is what we're doing. We're shutting down. Today, we would have 144 buses 
that uh, will be out of certifications with uh, Department of Transportation. They would have their stickers gone. So we have to be forward thinking and we got to look at everything we're listening to, absorb and uh, 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 look at all the things that people are talking about and see if we can make them happen or not make them happen and share that information. Don't wait for people to come to you. You got you got to be proactive and share that. Very good. That's awesome. Kurt. So just uh, dovetailing on the um, be proactive standpoint, just remember this. In, in the breach, if there's no decision made, somebody's going to fill the void. Uh, and if that void is filled by non-transportation people, then we're going to be stuck with the ramifications of that decision. So it, just strictly from that standpoint, I would want to be involved. Very good. Fill the void. Fill the void. Dr. Robinson. I think you're muted. Um, sorry about that. Beth. So okay. listen, listening to both Al's and, and Kurt's comments and, and the, the whole complexion of the conversation um, that we've been on, you know, to me, at the end of the day, it's 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 about all of us being students of the profession, right? It's, it's, it's about all of us knowing that every day there's something to learn. Every conversation, there's something to walk away with. Um, and and so subsequently, not only that you if you're walking away with something, you should also then come to the conversation so others can walk away much more enlightened, much more informed. And and I think that that if if we're all recognized that as professionals, you know that's who we are as professionals. We have to be constant students of the profession, so we have an open mind when we approach conversations, and we're always seeking out different ways, different examples to figure out how do we do our job better. But more importantly. We work for a single system, period. We all work for a single system and we all contribute that, to that system by the professionalism that we bring to the table. So if people have that perspective, um, mm -hmm. you know what? You could influence even the most hardened, um, arrogant SOB who think that he or she can do it by themselves because at the end of the day, you can't. It's a system that requires everybody to be on board all the time. And you know the buses can't run if we don't have fuel, and we can have buses full of fuel if they have flat tires. They ain't moving anywhere. You, you just whatever. Put any analogy you want, folks. It shows that that's that's what the system is about, and we have to be truly professions of that and bring our best selves, our best leadership to the table, to the conversation. And and it's not personal. I tell people all the time, it's not personal. It's not personal in the sense that. Don't get offended if, if somebody say, Al, I hear you, but we can't do that right now. Okay, then we got to figure out then what, what, what are the conditions that we need to change? Because if you think this, this is something that needs to happen, what are the conditions that needs to change? Who else do I need to convince if this is something I need to have? have if I see that there's a benefit for it, but the next person don't see it. And that's a part of being a student of the profession. Because now you have to study and be reflective to figure out how do you present this even further. And and we're seeing it. We're seeing it all over the place. Just a little quick segue. Kudos to Al and his folks. You know, you talk about at the table. Um, not only is Al at the table, but his folks are at the table. The other day we had this, this this these documents that were initially limited to to a certain group of people. Al was like, "Can my team have access to it?" Absolutely. If you think your team need to have access to it to work with it better, absolutely your team could have access to it. And and that's the empowering piece that people now know that they're at the table. The virtual table, and and that what that's what makes us work as a system um, all the time. And, and it's not about me. It's not about me, superintendent. I say it all the time. If I walk out of here tomorrow, I want our organization to be an organization that expect people to bring their voices to the table. And when people don't, everyone else is going to look at them funny, like, "What's wrong with you?" Well, one of the things I take away from that too, Dr. Robinson, is this idea of really you're taking taking ownership of of you know your role in this you know you're you not you know, it's not like being put upon you but you're actually taking ownership in it when al asked for those documents he's taking ownership of it tony can you hop on real quick and uh say a few parting words and then i'll close this out i just gonna just want to just thank you again for uh very insightful i think there's um there's really the, for the 2000 clients that we deal with uh for so many years we recognize there's really just there's two buckets. There's the buckets of clients that are just sit there 
and uh, they'll just wait for directions and then they'll complain saying man i don't have enough time to do what i was asked for and then there's other there's other groups saying i'm going to come up with some ideas because when i do get asked hopefully i picked you know one of those ideas or i could influence an idea so that's always be a big deal and i think that's that's just human nature right there's always going to be those people i just want to give you guys kudos because i've never seen the comments i've seen right now I mean, I'm seeing best webinars so far, and we've done a couple dozen at this point. I mean, right? I, we've done a lot of webinars across the industries, uh, very inspirational. That's the kind of things, and great content. Good old kudos. I've, guys, I've heard a lot of questions, uh, a lot of different ones, or, you know, they could go either way, but amazing. So thank you for the comments. Clearly, the topic was, was right on spot, and so, Thank you for your time, and uh, we're always we're looking what's going on in this industry. But don't don't wait till it's too late. You know that that's if you know a hurricane's coming, hurricane is coming. Don't wait till while it's pouring rain to do something to to protect your house. You get prepared. Hopefully you're over prepared, right? That's what we always say. It's okay to be over prepared. You know that's a good thing. That well nothing happened. Look what happened. No, it's a good thing. So thank you for your time. Thank you so much, Tony. I'm gonna to go over those real quickly. Some of the highlights again, be the leader you were hired to be. Don't wait for others. We talked about being proactive. In the breach, decisions are gonna be made. So fill the void. Don't let that void, that void just be filled. Uh, be a student of the profession. Uh, know that uh, every day there's something to learn. Come, I love this one, come um, to these conversations so that others leave feeling more informed. What a great point. And then one other thing that we said a little earlier, but I think it's also, we need to sometimes check our own attitudes. Uh, what it is that we, you know, may bring to the table that maybe should be left not at the table. Uh, I want to get credit or whatever other type of agenda we may have. So I want to thank our panelists again. I knew this would be a great discussion, and it really was. Um, I want to thank uh, NAPT again for your leadership um, during this very difficult time. You leadership definitely prior to the pandemic, but you definitely have taken it to another notch uh, during the pandemic. I want to say something we haven't talked too much about. That is, if you have a story or you have a best practice that can become part of our future webinar, if you could uh, email us at mystory@transfinder.com. Andy, you can move the slide to the next one. Um, mystory@transfinder.com, and it might make its way into another webinar, or it'll be on our best practices page. Because as I think we've all heard today, we all learn from each other, and so we don't care where these ideas come from. Uh, we want to document as many as we can. Again, I want to ask people to mark their calendars for next Tuesday, June 9th, 1 o'clock, for another Best Practices uh, webinar with NAPT. And until then, I just want to wish you all a great rest of your day. Thanks again, everybody. Have a great day. Okay. Thank you.